The Society for Culture and Environment extends a warm welcome. You are watching a session on Prithviraj Chauhan, the Emperor of Hearts, Anuja Chandramauli in conversation with Reema Huja from the Bhopal Literature and Art Festival January 2019. Anuja Chandramauli is an Indian author of fantasy and historical fiction. Ms. Reema Huja is an archaeologist, historian, heritage consultant and writer. She is currently Consultant Director at the Maharaja Savai Man Singh Tomb Museum, Jaipur and Managing Trustee of the Jaipur Virasat Foundation. She is also a member of the Society for Culture and Environment. Uh, thank you and thanks to the audience for uh, us. But more than that, thank you Anuja for being here. Do you mind just holding up a copy of your book? Because we've tried to have this book available. I think it will be here by tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, your other titles are here already. Is that correct? So, I want to, because there will be a lot of questions, I think we have a lot to say. I want to just jump straight in, which is, we have just heard about, you know, you've written on Ganga, Kartike, and you've done uh, short essays, you've done all kinds of things. What got you into writing? I think uh, I'm a, I love books. I'm, uh, even as a child, my favorite thing to do, it hasn't changed at all, my favorite thing to do is to curl up with a book. So that's how I used to spend the summer holidays and nowadays, you know, I hear parents yelling at their kids because they're always on their iPad and stuff like that. My mom used to yell at me because my nose was always buried in the pages of her book. She'd keep yelling, she'd say, you're so anti-social, you don't go out and play, you're always reading. But it's just, you know, books are my best books. It makes me sound a little lame, but I love books. And uh, uh, I think when you read a lot, and uh, I used to keep a little journal also, from when I was nine or something. So, you know, reading and writing for me, it's not like something I thought about too much. It's just always been a part of my life. And uh, I was supposed to uh, become a criminal psychologist. That was the plan. But I kind of got married at 20. So, uh, I, I, I thought, okay, you know, my career plans had to be put on hold. And I was also, there was an, I was also toying with becoming a foreign correspondent, traveling around the world and then writing about my experiences. So I thought since I can't, that's not an option right now, I figured I might as well, you know, cut the chase and start writing. So that's how it happened and I have no regrets, you know, just always will be a I think what's interesting is the bit you said about going around the world because I think you're going around the pages of history and you're certainly helping us share in that journey. And I think maybe some part of that criminal thing, as psychology and all of that is coming through, I mean, not in you being one, but in the way you're handling your characters. So again, before we come to Prithviraj Chauhan, the character and the book, uh, maybe a little bit about your other, is it now nine books that you have including this one? Yes, it's nine, right. A little bit about them, please. So uh, I, uh, again, uh, when it comes to uh, sitting down and deciding what you're going to write about, because you know, you're putting a bit of your heart and soul into it, it's a proper commitment and I'm a bit of a commitment for usually. So you know, and your, your mentors, your advisors, they all tell you to write about the things you know about, the things you care deeply about. And uh, my favorite books, the Mahabharata, always. And Arjuna is the great love of my life. And again, when it comes to this sort of thing, I'm very fickle, you know, because I may be a such a technical fan, and then suddenly I'm an MSD fan. It's like that. I, I'm just very fickle in my head. But Arjuna is a big constant in my life. I loved him as a child. I loved him growing up, and I still am very much in love with Arjuna. So it made sense for me to, you know, make that commitment and write my. It was. It, it, I didn't even think about it. It had to be Arjuna because I'm so crazy about it. So that's how my first book happened. And I really wasn't thinking about the mythology trend in India, you know, but that's how it is. At the time, uh, you know, Amish and Anand Neelakantan and, you know, all the mythology writers were really rocking it at the time. So my publishers, whenever I come up with some suggestion, they're always like, no, 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 I have some mythology ideas, ideas, ideas for you. I thought I was done with mythology, but I still keep writing in the genre. So, you know, it's, uh, Kamadeva was suggested by a publisher and I was intrigued, you know, I, I was intrigued, I thought, okay, let's, I didn't know much about him at the time, but I thought, why not, let's go for it. And Shakti again is, um, at the time I was doing uh, news content also and uh, the Delhi bus gang rape case had happened, the Delhi case had uh, Jyoti Singh, that case had happened and I was covering it and, you know, this one morning, uh, you know, you, you just a little shake and we just received news that she hadn't made it. 
and I, I was up uh, at some unworthy hour writing about it and I remember being so shaken and at that time I, I happened to remember something I read about how uh, every woman you know uh, is an incarnation of Shakti and Durga is within you know you don't have to look outside for people to protect you and to feel safe it's always inside you know and that really it just you know moved me a bit and that's how Shakti happened again it was like a very intense, very moving effort, you know, to just do the research and put it down. But it was also very empowering writing about Mahisha Ashramadini and, you know, the things women are capable of. So I don't really think too much about it. One book leads to the other. Uh, Kartikeya popped up with Admitted Shakti and I wrote about it. And Ganga's, you know, again, she's integral to Kartikeya's birth. And, you know, I kind of touched on the character there and she fascinated me and she stayed with me. So there was a book on Ganga and finally I convinced my publishers to let me branch out a bit and uh, you know, so we started in fiction, they were very enthused when I talked about with Rahul Chauhan because he's quite the dude and everybody likes him, you know, he's old school and chivalrous, handsome, he had the opponents to, you know, scoop up Sabyukta from under his enemy's nose and I, by the way that's not historically accurate. But anyway, that's how when you see Prithviraj, you see this dashing warrior and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Prithviraj later and I've also written about Padmavati. Yeah, that's it. And my next book is also in historical fiction, so I don't think that much these things just happen, I guess. I like, I like the way you just say you don't think that much these things happen. You know, nine books already and another one on the anvil, but we'll come to that. Uh, so let us come to Prithviraj Chauhan <laughs> then. Uh, because as you say, he is somebody who is part of, you know, everyone's growing up. It doesn't matter which part of the country you are in. And uh, he was obviously somebody you had read about in school. <laughs> so, how did this book come? You want to start with a reading maybe? I'll, I'll tell you how the book okay. came about and then I'll do a small reading from the book. So, uh, uh, with Pithira Chauhan, no, Chauhan, what happened was, uh, lots of people come up and ask, how come you're always writing about these North Indians, uh, you know, Pithviraj's are, why don't you write about someone from Tamil Nadu and people keep, keep asking me that and I again say I'm really not thinking about the North, South, the political correctness of it all. For me, with Pithviraj Chauhan, what happened was, uh, you know, we had his story, Pithviraj and Samyukta, in our third standard textbook. And I don't think as students we read our textbooks with any degree of enthusiasm. We are all like, please, it's a textbook, I don't want to touch it. But I used to keep reading the story over and over again because I loved it so much. And it's very weird the things your memory chooses to retain, no? All the things in the world, that story stayed with me from third grade all the way through school, college. And then suddenly, you know, I think, okay, I want to go and write a full book about it because I really love this character. And my publishers were super enthusiastic about it and that's how it happened, you know. It was, uh, it was a very lovely journey writing about Prithviraj. And I think I'll just do a small uh, portion from... I usually start a book from the beginning. So this one also is a little bit about his birth, about his uh, mom having a certain premonition about the special child she's carrying. And so, you know, there's a hint of glory there, there's a hint of guts there. And she also has this uh, inkling of disaster, you know, a little bit of foreboding. So I like this uh, portion of the book, so I'll just read from the beginning. The queen tossed and turned her sweat streaked body caused the soft sheets to cling to her contours as she stifled a scream that fought to burst from her lips. A good girl must be seen, not heard, she had been taught since childhood. Silently she pleaded when she knew not whom, begging to escape the terror that was engulfing her. When that failed, she tried to wake up. Her efforts were entirely futile. No matter how much she tried, a force she could not withstand tore her apart. She was swimming against the currents of a raging river as predators with serrated teeth and spiked tails pursued her ruthlessly. The wind snatched her from their jaws as they were about to swallow her and lifted her highly up in the air. It ripped off her garments before releasing her into endless space. As she plunged into the depths below, she could not hold back the screams of agony from bursting out in a shrill cacophony. 
Then she was falling through emptiness, plummeting towards certain death. Then with a suddenness that made her dizzy, everything went still. Holding her swollen belly in her arms, she opened her eyes. She was standing at the threshold of a stone temple. Before her was an altar where a smokeless fire was burning. Vigorous and strong, it was brighter than her eyes could bear. Shining with divine vehemence, it beckoned her forward. Enraptured, she stared into its depths. She watched the mesmerizing dance of the flames as they swayed in discord. Tears sprang into her eyes and she clasped her hands in prayer as the Earth Mother addressed her throbbing heart. What is it that you would know of me? Tell me of the child. Tell me of the child I bear in my womb. A mother always knows. A mother must. My boy will be the greatest of kings, a mighty warrior, a lion among men, and as such will be entitled to the king's share of success, prosperity, and happiness. He will shine with the brilliance of a thousand suns. His name will live forever. So it shall be. The flame in his soul is destined to burn for as long as his lion's heart can bear it. Blessed as he is with the tages of the divine, he will shine brightest when he makes the ascent to the pinnacle of glory, just before his swift, swift descent to darkness and the depths of failure. For so it must be. Never, I will never allow such a fate to befall my son. A mother is a fool. He was never yours alone and never will be. Prepare yourself for the reign of the king of the earth, for fame and fortune, love and death, glory and grief. The flames rose higher and higher, oblivious to the mother who wailed in misery. Blinded by the all-encompassing radiance, magnified by the strength of her tears, she was ill-prepared for the darkness that descended without warning, snuffling out every trace of the sacred fire. Silence was broken only by infernal howls of abject sorrow, a mother's terrible lament amid the hushed murmur of a premonition repeated over and over. Prith Viraj, Prith Viraj, Prith Viraj, King of the Earth. All around there was nothing but darkness and the memory of light. Wow. The rest of the book is equally enthralling. I mean, uh, it's a page turner. And I was, uh, I was engrossed. I was up reading it till the end. Thank you, that's good. Plan. So I don't want to put on my historian's cap or my anything's cap because you are very clear when we were talking that it is historical <coughs> fiction. And you made a very uh, pertinent point where you say, you know, history is not something that you know, you cannot replicate. You have so many sources, but you can't actually say this is exactly what happened. But what you have done is uh, you've got into the minds of so many characters and you have very strong characters. So you have, so for all of you, you know, Prithviraj Chauhan ki kahani sabko batai. So that's not something in itself new. But you have taken out aspects of it that may not be commonly known today, but were probably very commonly known or rather known to the common masses even then, which is about his mother for example. Today, most people are more than happy to say, yes, his nana, his maternal grandfather was the ruler of Delhi, which he was not. So you bring out the fact that you know, she's a princess. Uh, so these are these very strong, his paternal grandmother and his mother are two very strong characters. Do you want to talk a bit about them? Uh, so that's the weird thing, as I was telling her, it's the weird thing about uh, Indian history. It's like, see, first of all, ours is an oral tradition and it's very, very faith-based. You know, people are always asking me, what's the difference between writing, you know, about histo historical characters and mythological characters? And I really can't think of much of a difference because in India, we're very worshipful about certain figures, certain legendary figures from history and mythology. We tend to deify all of them and worship them as it were. You know, even now we worship cricketers. It's that attitude we Indians have. We just need to, if we admire somebody, we have to worship them and you know, we don't like, or it's very faith based, we don't like to question their antecedents, we don't like to talk about things like historical accuracy, all those things. And I'm always, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it's kind of curious that uh, when we go through records, you find that, you know, they don't mention anything at all about the women in history. If you take Prithviraj Chauhan, there's very little, the 
Your historian didn't even feel or uh, think it's necessary to write about his mom, his grandmom, his wives. He had uh, quite a few wives, you know. And Samyukta is kind of like a character, a fictional character. You know? But there were other wives he had who were actually, you know, uh, real flesh and blood women. And nobody saw the importance of, uh, nobody thought it was necessary to give those women a voice. And uh, when I saw, I started digging deeper. I really wanted to find out more about the women in his life. Because uh, let's face it, a man's history is incomplete without the women in his life. And when I started digging, I found that uh, you know there were powerful women in his life. First of all, uh, it's his uh, maternal grandmother. Her name is uh, Kanchan Devi, and she was a princess and very powerful. Even in her day, hugely respected and much loved. She was the daughter of the Gujarati king. Uh, again, a very famous historical character, Maharaj uh, Sidraj Jay Singh. She was his daughter and uh, a, a, a big mover and shaker of that age because uh, she was a very active, active player in the political milieu of the time, a strategist. And you know, she's responsible for training Prithviraj and making him the kind of king she had always envisioned for her heirs. And uh, next, if we take his mother, again, Karpura, uh, Karpura Devi also was well educated. And uh, they say that uh, he was a minor when his father passed away. I don't know, in those days, those days they really weren't like that particular about minority and all. But some sources do say that she ruled as uh, his regent till he came of age. So we can assume that he was really, maybe his facial hairs hadn't even shown up yet, probably. So, you know, she was the regent. So, you know, these were women deserving of respect, big players in the age. And I tried to, you know, kind of. Uh, give them also a role in the narrative of Prithviraj Chauhan. And uh, so these were the female characters who made a huge impression. And another thing is, uh, with, with guys like Prithviraj, it becomes a one-man show. But it usually isn't, you know, it's, uh, he has a team. It's like uh, there are the, the ministers, the uh, people who are responsible. So, so Amira, let's talk about that team, some of the people, because you, again, you fleshed out their character. Is that coming from your head? Is that no? Not really, you know. So uh, this is not. This is based on. I keep telling people my style of writing is faction. It's uh, fiction which has its roots in fact. Okay. So the names. So I recognize the ministers, but what about the childhood friends who grew up with him? Well, that's uh, that's fictional. The childhood <laughs> friends are fictional, but yeah. But with regard to the team, uh, with all these things, especially Prithviraj's case, uh, there is. Uh, People really couldn't understand what went wrong between the first battle of Tarain, which was his greatest, uh, it was a thumping victory for him. It was a great moment in history and people don't, uh, aren't sure what went so horribly wrong between the first and the second battle of Tarain, which led to his defeat and death ultimately. And uh, so when I dug a little deeper, I found that uh, the whole Samyukta thing is, uh, it was written two centuries after Prithviraj's death. The uh, accounts uh, written during his lifetime make zero mention of Samyukta. You know, they have mentioned, a, a deign to mention the names of his minor wives, but Samyukta is not there. So this is a fictional account, but when I tried to find some factual evidence for what went wrong, I could, uh, there was uh, evidence that uh, Mahamantri Kadamba was, you know, a very important uh, character in Prithviraj's life because he was a very smart, shrewd man and uh, Prithviraj did lean on him a bit to take, you know, to hold the administrative reins and stuff like that. They say that he died under mysterious circumstances. Something went wrong between Prithviraj and uh, this Mahamantri. They say that he was found in the women's harem. There's talk that he may have been having an affair with either his mum or one of his wives. So there's just a little bit, they, they're never clear and they are like to kind of like, don't like to look at such things, you know, taboo, sexual, scandals, we kind of tend to look away. So it's just blurry, but something went wrong. This Mahamantri died and his uncle Karma, who was again his father's brother, uh, again, who was a major influence in Prithviraj's life, he also passed away around that time. So, you know, key members in his team kind of uh, died uh, between the first and second battle of Tarin. So, I tried to point out, uh, you know, the uh, influences in the king's life, and there's also evidence that he may have been a drug addict dealing with a drug habit, which is again something we don't like to talk about of when it comes to someone of his stature. But they do say that when Mohammed uh, Shahabuddin of Gore showed up for the second battle, he was kind of out of it. it took some, they say he was asleep, but he 
wasn't just asleep, I think he was really high and it took him some time to even mount his horse and get to the battlefield. So people who tried to control the king in those days, the pundits, the physicians, they kind of uh, you know, uh, encouraged these guys to take, to take up their drug habit just to control them a little bit more. So again, dark secrets in our history which I don't think we should shy from. So you were talking about the battle and I will come back to say time all of that in a bit. Uh, I just want to say for uh, those of us who have not pinpointed it, Prince Viran was about 25 when he died. So you know, it's, he achieved a lot in a short time. Even by the standards of that time where if you are old enough to stand up, you are a grown, you are not a boy, you are a man. You know, talwar apparently then you use it. So, uh, one of the, the historians who you have used, in, uh, you have acknowledged that Shrad Sharma has talked about uh, the fact that Prithviraj himself had led night campaigns and won victories. And then to be asleep on the eve of the second battle, you know, he was surprised because there was an attack on the camp. So, you know, he's kind of said that this is unforgivable in a warrior. And I think he's one of the others who, because he's not writing as a He's not shy from the truth, he's actually laying the fact out for someone like you to use in your book. And I think that is one of the things, you bring out a character like they were a real person with the flaws. Do you visualize them? Are you filling in the blanks? How, how do you relate to someone like that? What's going on in your mind? So, so for me, whether it's a god, a goddess or a king, for me, in, when once you know I'm doing the research and I'm writing about them, they all become you know very much a part of my reality. You know, they are people I'm very comfortable with. It'll sound very I don't know weird when I say it, but for me, they become a part of my life. They're like my buddies, my friends, people I'm very close to. So there's a certain uh, intimacy there. You know, it's like a real relationship as far as I'm concerned. And so I can't really put them on a pedestal. And even when I write about their flaws, as you call it, I don't. Hold it against them. I don't judge. Let's them. talk for the audience about how you dealt with, say, the violence which, or the black dark, the darkness which often yeah. engulfs Prithviraj and it, you know, the, the outpouring that happens as a result. Some of those examples. Now, see, I think uh, these uh, somebody like Prithviraj is so remarkable. There's no need to whitewash his character. There's no need to, you know, surgically remove the bits which people find uncomfortable or unpleasant. I think as a whole, he's still, he's still a hero. He's still a great, great man, worthy and deserving of, you know, the stature he has in history. For me, he is a legend. He always will be. And uh, when you're doing your research, when you, you know, I'm always searching for uh, uh, the things that make him human. And uh, when we talk about this king who, uh, you know, it was such an intensely lived life, you know. He, for him there was no in between. There was none of the boring, mundane stuff which we experience as humans, you know. Our routine life, the boring, tedious stuff. For somebody like Prithviraj, it's like, you know, the height of glory. And, you know, the, even when he falls in love, it's such a, you know, it's such a, such a passionate thing for him. It's like, you know, a hundred lifetimes crammed into a few years, you know. From a very young age, he was just a boy king and he had to deal with a rebellion. You know, one of his uncles, his name was Nagraj, he rebelled against Prithvi and at that time his response was, you know, the response of a seasoned warrior. He crushed his uncle, okay, and he also ordered that the heads of the rebels be displayed around the fort. Now today, in, 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 in contemporary times, we'll say, what a barbarian, what a savage act. The thing is, we can't judge them, you know, by today's norms. In those days, you know, Shatriyas played at war. We like to glamorize it and romanticize it in our epics. But war is an ugly business. And it was very much, you know, their uh, routine thing to go out there, fight and, you know, treat their enemies harshly. Because it was like, if you're not going to kill your enemies, they're going to kill you. It's that simple. So it was something he had to do and hence I would say, I would agree if people say uh, he's no different from the Turska uh, invaders, the barbarians, the Muslim invaders. You know, everyone did the same thing. There's no king, no good king. I mean to be a good king you have to be a bad person at some level. You know, but if you are going to judge them. So I would say don't judge them. It's like what it was, it was what was demanded of his, him at that time and he had the guts to do what it took to hold on to power. So I find that 
very admirable about him and I'm, I'm sorry that bad things happened to those who crossed him but bad things did happen. He was very brutal and he put out rebellions and he was amazingly successful as a military strategist to somebody as young as him. He was a mighty warrior which is why you know all the way to Tarain he also managed the rare feat of uniting all the petty warring kingdoms around him because he was the strongest wasn't, you know, they didn't respond to the fact that he was handsome or that he was charming. He was the mightiest and the most savage of the Lord, which is why they were content to follow his lead, you know, and it could have changed the face of history if only he managed to win the battle of Tarain. It would have changed the whole face of Aryavarta. You know, we could have been a united, very, very, that's the thing about history, you know, the what-ifs, but no point dwelling on it. Exactly, there are too many what-ifs. And if it was only fiction, you would have taken the if any other way. It's not. Uh, do you want to come in with a reading at this point? Or uh, show? Sure. Yeah. Just to give a little bit of an intro, uh, when I was wrestling, uh, my uh, initially when I pitched it to my publishers, I said I'll do a, a major love story because as I said, it was difficult to convince them to let me write history. So I said, how about uh, Prithviraj and Samyukta? I promised them a love story, but the thing is, I hate love stories. Wait, wait. I, I want to come in at this point before you carry on. So just show the copy of your book again, Anuja. You look fresh. Alright, when you think of Prithviraj Chauhan, if you see the film or you know anything, what is the one thing that you think you are actually, not you think, you are waiting for? You know he's going to meet Sayyukta, Sayyogita, whichever, whichever version you are using. And then there's going to be the, the famous, you know, the Swayambara, the Swayambara scene at the, at the game. Uh, so please read this book, you'll be waiting. And you'll be waiting a long time. I don't want to be a spoiler in that way. But now come in with your reading. Yeah, so what happened was I promised them a love story but uh, the thing is I'm not a great fan of love stories, especially non-existent love stories because uh, see, when I did the research, there's not a single historian who will agree that Samyukta and Prithviraj happened. You know, like I said, the story was written uh, two centuries later to put a nice spin on a very ugly, dark period of Indian history when we sustained a massive, humiliating defeat. Okay, at the hands of Shihabuddin of Gur. Okay, so Prithviraj might have made his peace with it before he died, but we certainly did, you know. So, which is why we came up with this charming story where he fell in love with his princess, was betrayed by her father, lost the best of his men while he was carrying him away, which is what led to his defeat. It, none of it happened. So, you know, uh, my sister read this book and she called to scream at me. She said, what the hell is your problem, man? Samyukta, you promised us a love story. Look at the cover and you've given her one lousy chapter. You're a jerk. And I was like, I'm sorry. I can't apologize for it. So I've written this one chapter and it's written by, uh, there's a character in this book called uh, Jayanaka. Okay, Jayanaka is the author of uh, Prithviraja Vijaya. Okay, which is the only uh, authentic history, it's incomplete because it's supposed to be a record of his triumph and we know what happened to him. So it's incomplete, just uh, you know, um, so I have this character, this is entirely fictional, this is my take and I've uh, kind of like just given a, uh, the book is not written in Jayanaka's voice but this chapter alone, you know, I have it written in uh, Jayanaka's voice so I don't want to deprive it. It's, it's also in italics. And it's, you know, originally, supposedly it was in Sanskrit. So you made that very clear. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, definitely some creative liberties which I've taken. But don't, never let it be said that I led you to expect a love story and deprived you 100%. So I'll leave it up for you. Destiny led her to us some distance from the Jinamata temple. She and the rest of her company were across the river. It was obvious that they had come a long way and their horses were blown. They were the strangest group of women we had ever seen. About half a dozen in strength, they were all young and beautiful, dark as the fabled blue lotus. They wore their long hair gathered in plaits which came down to their waists. Not an inch of their bodies was visible. They wore embroidered leggings and an upper garment of a sort I had never seen before. Full sleeved with an embroidered bodice that was gathered at the bust and fell in flowing swirls to the knees. They carried short swords, water skins, and small shields. One even carried a bow. Even among these beauties, Samyukta stood out.
when she caught a glimpse of Maharaj Prithviraj, she smiled in pure delight and teeth that were perfect as pearls were revealed, but it was the feeling behind it that would have lit up the darkest of rooms. Her face was round as the moon and of delicate colouring. Even with the wind whipping her clothes, it was obvious that her body was sculpted to perfection. See, this is why I hate writing romance, you know. That's why. <laughs> and so remember, it's Jayanaka's voice mainly. And, the, and when the king looked into those magnificent brown eyes, which glowed with an inner light, he was utterly lost. Seeing us gave them a fresh lease and they signaled to us urgently. They had captured the king's fancy at any rate. We made arrangements for a boat to ferry them across and they seemed nervous and excitable, urging us to hurry, looking over their shoulders all the time. We soon saw why. It appeared that the entire army of Kanauj was at their heels. Our archers tried to provide them with cover, but two of the women belonging to Samyukta's guard fell dead. Already they had sent for the elephants to be lowered into the water as a makeshift bridge to allow the army easy access. The others shielded the princess with their own bodies and they made it across in one piece. The king lifted her up gently and placed her in front of him on his saddle. From that moment on, they were lost to everything else and seemed aware only of each other. Behind them, a terrible battle raged. Shouts of fury, the clash of arms, arrows zigzagging all around, finding their marks with meaty thumbs, horses neighing, men dying, women screaming. Prithviraj and Samyukta were oblivious to it all. It was love of the sort neither had experienced before, not to be confused with passion, desire, affection or infatuation. That rarest of incandescent feelings which few among the mortals are chosen to experience. Both were consumed by it, filled to the brim with irresistible need and a profound, almost sacred joy that they had found each other. The danger that surrounded them on all sides made their love all the more moving for it was heightened by the terrible fear that they might lose each other. This was the love that Bath sang about, the thing that people hoped for and prayed they might find one day. The thing that too many lived and died for, and die they did. So many of our men and theirs felt that day, sacrificed on the altar of the terrible love, that force of nature that swept Prithviraj Chauhan and Samyukta away, and all of us who knew and loved them so much as well. It was the final gift of the merciless goddess who had loved him. Its invincible power would destroy a great king and the unified Aryavarta he had come close to achieving. Only a handful of us survived the journey back. Padri and Nahar fell. I never understood why I alone, the least impressive of a little company, managed to outlive them all. Prithviraj wept openly for them during the grand funeral rites he had performed in their honour. Princess Samyukta stood by his side, sharing his grief and everything else. Her quiet dignity and strength was a palpable thing and the king clung to it for dear life. It was only in her arms that he forgot his pain, the demons from his past and the terrors of an uncertain future. And so he remained there, unwilling to let go. His only solace was the comfort of her loving embrace. He willingly drowned in the depths of her eyes, which understood the dark secrets of his soul and loved him all the more for it. Even defeat would be bearable to the unconquered hero as long as she was by his side. They loved each other with a wild and reckless abandon, pouring the depths of their intense passion into each other, like ghee over flames that burned higher and higher, bathing them with its radiance and divine splendor, burning their souls and fusing them together. They rebelled in each other, sundering the bonds of this world, hearkening to the beauty and mysterious forces that call them from beyond. Ultimately, they loved each other so fiercely because deep down was the sobering knowledge that neither cared to admit. If their sublime romance lacked one thing, it was permanence. While the king and his lover remained ensconced in each other's arms, uncaring of the trouble in the world around them, matters of great import were unfolding. Mahamantri Kadambavas was a cautious man given easily to suspicion. He had seen much of human nature and had a dim view of it. Not being a believer in love or coincidence, he began to investigate. The bold and beautiful company of female guards who had accompanied the princess were watched closely. Even so, the Mahamantri nearly missed the plot. The cleverest of the lot had been resourceful. She 
had been carrying on a romance with one of the guards assigned to the watchtower. One night, he and the rest of his company fell dead, poisoned by loving hands. By the time the alarm was sounded, a small unit of Jaichan's crack troops had entered the fort. Fighting broke out and by the time the Mahamantri and the Senapati found out, it was almost too late. The beautiful assassins had been told to strike. Their targets were Prithviraj and the young prince. In the confusion that followed, it was hard to find out what happened exactly. Many of the eyewitnesses were dead. Kanha and Karmavas had broken into the harem to stop the warrior maidens and protect the royal family. They succeeded in so far that the king and his son escaped the cowardly attempt on their lives. When the fighting broke out, Prithviraj rushed out naked as the day he was born, sword in hand. Two of the assailants <coughs> fell by his hand. Kanha and Kadambavas prevailed over the rest, but they were not long for this world either. Women did not fight fair and their daggers had been poisoned. The king could only watch helplessly as his beloved uncle and invaluable Mahamantri died in a pool of their own vomit. Senapati Skand arrived to give the king his report. The survivors of the ambush and the one who had let them in had been captured. By orders of the king, the soldiers were to be dismembered. As for the warrior maiden, her punishment was so terribly inhuman, I cannot put it down. But her screams rang out across the barracks for three days before death claimed her. None of us shed tears for her plight. When the king returned to his chamber, heart sick with grief, he had no inkling that the tragedies of that night were far from over. Princess Samyukta lay as he had left her. The ivory hilt of the dagger that had been plunged into her chest was visible between her perfect breasts. Maharani Padma, who was standing by the side of the body, turned as he approached. I did promise I wouldn't have your host poisoned, she said. It took three of the guards to pull him off her and even so he nearly throttled his wife. They never spoke to each other again. Torn apart, Maharaj Prithviraj was prostrate with grief. The Vaidya was in constant attendance. I went to see my friend too and my heart broke at the sight of what the mighty monarch had been reduced to. Drugged out of his skull and drooling like an imbecile, so far gone in his pain that it would prove impossible for him to return to sanity. Later, when death came for him under such lamentable circumstances, my only comfort was that Prithvira Chauhan had already died at the precise moment when he was separated for good from his Samyukta. <laughs> Everyone blamed the princess from Kanauj for what happened. Hariraj, his younger brother, made me promise that I would not mention her in my Prithviraja Vijaya. He wanted her very memory expunged from recorded history. I obeyed, for he rules now and bravery is not my forte. And yet, I cannot find it in my heart to consign my true account of their tragic love story to the flames. It is not what my king would have wanted, and so I will leave it concealed in my chambers. If it is meant to be found, it will be. Their love was real, and though the prince and though the price proved too high for them, I have no doubt that if given the chance, if given the choice, even in light of everything that happened, Prithviraj Chauhan would still choose love and Samyukta every single time. So this beautifully written and beautifully read out piece is actually probably just imagination. Uh, I mean it is here but even in the original, uh, the way it has come down to us as you said, there is no known, there is no uh, historical figure that we know of who could have been this princess from Kannauj. Having said that, there is a lot more to the book and I think we have time for some questions and answers and before we jump into it very very quickly, future projects? So, uh, my next book is also uh, in the historical fiction genre. So, my next book is on uh, Mohammed bin uh, Tukluk and it should be out over the summer. Again, I've tried to, you know, again, he's a very confusing person. It's hard to tell whether he was an awesome dude or a real jerk, but I like him. I really do. <laughs> he's troubled and twisted and he's my kind of guy. And, uh, yeah. I think you have a time machine which gives you a different insight. So thank you for this. Let's. Uh, I think we have time for a few questions. Two questions. All right. Uh, please identify yourself. If you're asking a question. Yeah, I'm Gautam. <coughs> Been having a chat with Anuja before, but sitting in a small town in Sevakasi, and uh, you know, I don't know how much you travel from the Bengal to Lahore. How do you get yourself to writing such historical books with such vivid? 
you know, sprinkling of imagination. Yeah. Uh, as you asked if I travel a lot, actually I don't. Uh, I'm what you call an armchair traveler, and all the traveling is done entirely in my head. So you know, I do my research and I try to reconstruct a certain slice of history, and I try to you know do justice to that period, keep it authentic. Which is why I I think uh, research for projects like this is very important, and I love the research process. It's not boring or tedious like people seem to think it is. It's a lot of fun. And the, the trick is to, you know, keep to the beaten track, to focus on this character because it keeps branching out and, you know, it's a fascinating journey which you can go from, you know, a small town in Sivakasi all the way back in time. We talked of time traveling. It's nice to revisit certain uh, interesting periods of history and, you know, uh, bring those characters to life. It's a fascinating process and I really love it. Anyone else? I've talked, uh, spoken a lot, but I have a question and while people are maybe coming in with this, which is how are you looking at the old and the new? Because we were talking and I think somewhere the past and the present seem to come together in your mind. Oh, uh, it's a very interesting thing uh, when you're uh, like, you know, at least in Pitra Chauhan, it was very true, but while I was researching it, uh, I found it very interesting that, you know, they, uh, the kings of your, they kind of tended to grapple with the same problems which we are dealing with today. For instance, even in uh, Prithviraj's time, uh, Mahmud of uh, Ghazni had always, you know, made his presence felt in India. And so the Muslims were, uh, uh, from his time, there were Muslims living in India and they were hated and they were made to pay a tax. You know, we all talk about the jizya which the Hindus had to play when the pay when the Muslim uh, rulers came when the slave kings were in power, the Kaljis, the Tughlaqs, all the way to Akbar's day when he lifted that tax, you know. But we always leave out the fact that before the Muslim kings made the Hindus pay a tax, the Hindu kings were making the Muslims pay a tax. You know, that's something from Prithviraj's time. And uh, one of the very interesting characters was uh, Moin Chisti, the Sufi mystic. He was also a contemporary of Prithviraj and I have a scene where he talks to Prithviraj about it. He says that it's hard enough being a minority community in India and he asked Prithviraj not to uh, you know make the force this tax on them and Prithvi <coughs> says uh, see I, I will do one thing I will be stricter about law and order issues I will make sure that the minorities aren't hurt on my watch you know uh, his Mahamantri was like an extremist Hindu fanatic so he used to hurt the minority communities so he put his uncle Kanha in charge so that the Muslims will feel safe but he said I won't lift the tax you know that, that, that's going to then to make up the difference I'll have to ask the Hindus to pay that's not going to improve <laughs> relations between them so it's just something that even they had to deal with even in those days you know uh, where uh, in every state in every province every minor kingdom they had their language their food their costumes their beliefs which they were very proud of you know so and uh, when uh, Mahmud of Ghazni and Mahmud of Gore showed up we were already fighting among ourselves and you know it was it was very standard practice for you know uh, enemy kingdoms to go and cast their lot with the invader. They were more comfortable with a Muslim ruler than you know allowing their enemy to prevail. So that was the mentality even then we were very divided. So you saw it in the time of Ghazni, you saw it in the time of Gur. Later when uh, you know the slave kings, when uh, the Mughals came, again it was the same. We were pretty much divided and then we talk about the British and their divide and rule policy. They didn't have to do anything. We were divided all by ourselves. You know, no need to blame them for it. Because it's very, and even today, you know, it's very hard. Though we take pride in our Indian identity, uh, we do tend to be jerks to minority communities. It's kind of, you know, hard to make it work in India. It's something we still struggle with. And I think it's kind of uh, uh, hopeful that despite everything, you know, we still, at least on paper, we are a secular nation. It's something, you know, to be proud of. That, that's a lot to be proud of, yes. Uh, any more questions before we draw this session to a close? I must say, as a, as a lead into our talking to each other today, when we met up yesterday for the first time, at one point when the Mundecha Bandhu were you know, treating us to the Drupad, and the last one, the Kabi, and you know, they basically what it boils down to is what is the I, what is the B, B, and how many universes. And 
history is a very sobering way of realizing that uh, everything has been, and maybe not for the best, and perhaps what humans can do is remember that as we strive for the best. So, thank you very much for this. I Thank you so much, ma'am. I wish I could have a history teacher like you. Thank you for watching the session from BLF 2019. Kindly subscribe to our channel for more such videos.